she was a very brave campaigning journalist. So brave that um, because she was arguing the case of the Russian Germans for their homeland, she'd lost her job and her flat, which was the only possession she would ever have. And um, she went on through the 1990s to be uh, to campaign absolutely to the risk of her life again and again against official corruption and um, battling away to create a de democratic space and to educate people about the horrors of the past uh, so that they wouldn't sentimentalize communism. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. Welcome to the annual Mary Belknap Distinguished Lecture at the Foreign Policy Association. And I'd like to acknowledge Mary, who's with us uh, this evening. Mary, I would say this even if she were not, if uh, she weren't present. Uh, Mary is probably, not probably, Mary is uh, the best vice chairman the Foreign Policy Association has ever had. Everybody. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Chloe Crave. Uh, Chloe uh, is an outstanding social sciences, uh, social studies, social sciences, uh, social studies teacher at Herrick's High School uh, and a dynamo at the annual Great Decisions uh, Teachers Institute that the Foreign Policy Association holds every year. She recommended uh, this evening's speaker, uh, an authoritative writer on matters Russian, uh, who has authored uh, a fascinating book, Lost and Found in Russia, Lives in a Post-Soviet Landscape, uh, and uh, uh, who just happens to be Chloe's stepmother. <laughs> Susan Richards, uh, is also the author of Epics of Everyday Life, Encounters in a Changing Russia, which won the Penn uh, Time Life Award for nonfiction. She edits Open Democracy Russia, part of Open Democracy, the website about global affairs, which she co-founded. After her doctorate on Alexander Solzhenitsyn from St. From Anthony's College, Oxford University, she initiated a program of talks, conferences, and debates at London's Institute of Contemporary Arts and worked as a film producer. With her husband, the television producer uh, Roger Grafe, she started Book Aid, a charity that sent uh, over a million English language books to public libraries throughout uh, the Soviet Union. Without uh, further ado, uh, Susan Richards. It's very nice to be here this evening. Thank you for inviting me. I'm going to start by telling you a tall story. It's not at all the kind of story that speakers at such an august institution usually tell. And I confess I had such difficulties um, digesting this story that I thought of leaving it out of my book, but then that would have been cowardly. Um, first, a little background. The year is 1993. Communism's just fallen, and the mood in the West is triumphant. It's the heyday of free market economics. Management consultants from McKinsey's are jetting in, as are economists from Harvard and professors from the London School of Economics, all honing in on Moscow excited by the prospect of turning Russia into a capitalist democracy. For my part, I was having a much harder time keeping my hopes up, because I'd spent a lot of time in Russia over the previous few years, and I could see the tremendous mismatch between the script in the head of all those advisors and what was actually happening on the ground um, in ordinary people's lives. And it's the long-term consequences of that mismatch that I want to talk about today. 
I'd set out a year earlier, right after the fall of communism, to chronicle the transition um, from the point of view of ordinary people. And I was actually looking for a good news story because my Russian friends were so gloomy that I wanted to cheer them up and I wanted to cheer myself up. And I thought I'd found the perfect vantage point, a place in the countryside which really looked as if it was going to come through the transition very fast and come through and be very prosperous. It was a small town on the Volga and it was improbably called Marx. And yes, um, nearby there is another town called Engels. <laughs> and um, they'd been German towns ever since Catherine the Great's time when, when she had invited um, Europeans, mostly Germans, but French too and, and others, to uh, come and settle on this, what was then the far eastern frontier of Russia. And because she too had just the hope that I'd had that Russia was going to turn into um, a Western power. And she thought that by bringing these, um, these Germans, it would, she would sort of hasten the process up. Anyway, when the Nazis invaded, Stalin deported all of the Germans, either to Siberia or to Central Asia. And after the war, they weren't allowed back to their homeland. They'd had this big homeland on the Volga around Marx. And um, just before the fall of communism, to make amends for this, they'd been given back this homeland. And the Germans had added the sweetener that they would back it economically. So it really did look like one bit of the countryside that was going to fly. Anyway, it didn't happen, of course. When everything collapsed, so too did this fine project. And um, when I got there, uh, I found that whereas everywhere in Russia up until then, people had welcomed me with open arms, no one would talk to me at all. And th they treated me as if I was some kind of spy. That's by way of background to the weird story I'm now going to tell you. It's about a town called Zarafshan, which stands in the middle of the Uzbek desert. It's a town full of highly educated mining engineers, um, nuclear physicists, and um, because it has uranium and vast mine, mines of gold. And they had their own very idiosyncratic reaction to the disintegration of the Soviet Union. I went there knowing nothing about it because I was trying to track down a particular group of Russian Germans. And I was not only unprepared in that way, I was also, I'd been caught short in another respect. Uh, I, my friend, Ira, with whom I was traveling, only had a very short space of time for the journey. So um, I hadn't had time to get a visa to go into Uzbekistan. And she said, do you think everything's changed? You don't need a visa. Just, we'll travel like the old days. I'll lend you a friend's Russian passport, and you wrap up your head in a headscarf. It'll be all right. Anyway. I usually, um, I trusted what she said. So we set off. And um, they, they did quiz me very carefully. And I didn't look at all like the woman in the photograph. But I got through. Um, but when we landed, it became clear that we had come to a very strange place. It was a closed town, and that means closed to foreigners. And word got round that there was a foreigner in town, and the KGB was after me. Now, there was a very kind man called Vasya, who was a water engineer, who offered to hide me, uh, and next day to get me out of the town. So Ira and I... Um, were entertained that evening by this wonderful man who, like Sherazade, tried to keep, um, keep our minds off the dreadful fact that we were being hunted by the secret police. And um, he started by saying, you know what happened a few weeks ago? There was, um, it must have been actually a few months ago, there was this man who was on guard at night watch at the mine, and um, he and his fellow saw a shining figure going coming towards them. 
and he said, halt, who goes there? And stop or I'll shoot. And the shining figure went on coming towards them. And so he shot, and the shining figure went up in sparks. And he fell paralyzed. Um, and he said, there was a voice in my head saying, you're going to be paralyzed for 93 days, and then we'll give you back your legs. And indeed, during those 93 days, invisible hands, they said, tried to abduct him from the hospital. Now, by this time, I was thinking, this is all very well. He's trying to entertain me, but what's it all about? Um, it turned out that actually there was an epidemic of paranormal visitations going on in this town. And everyone was seeing them. I mean everyone. Like hundreds of miners and engineers at a time were seeing uh, a UFO which had come down over the thing which extracts gold from rock and was hovering over it. They were, they were talking about encounters with hairy beings and um, all sorts of strange things. Seeing UFOs was a daily occurrence. Anyway, um, the, the, to top it all off, it turned out that even the mayor had, um, had been getting messages from outer space about where the best gold seams were. And he was so afraid of telling uh, the Communist Party, which was in its last days, that he put off for some time. But when he did eventually tell them, the Communist Party took it all very seriously and sent scientific investigations down. Now, Anyway, by the end of the night, um, we'd had, we were bundled off on, on, on the next plane next morning, and we, we did get away from the KGB, but by the time we arrived back in Moscow, if Ira hadn't been there, I wouldn't have believed any of this. It was um, all so improbable. But I did take it seriously enough to start to ask why it was that all these highly educated people could have been um, enthralled to such an extraordinary story. And I've got a long way towards understanding that in the course of the last 20 years. Nations and empires, like individuals, hold themselves together by means of stories, stories which define them. And I think of these stories as operative myths. And the 20th century, as we know, was governed by two extraordinarily powerful ones. And when I, when I went out to the Soviet Union in 88 to research my first book, censorship was just being lifted. And it was the start of an orgy of truth-telling that would demolish the Soviet Union's operative myth. So persuasive was it that through much of the 20th century, it had also held in thrall much of the West's intelligentsia too, as we know. At the time, what fascinated me when I was writing my first book was how it was that masses of ordinary people had gone on believing in this myth until the end, against the evidence of their senses. I mean, it was clearly not leading to prosperity. And one of the answers has stayed with me. It was a young woman who said, I know it sounds incredible now, but we all said to ourselves that what was happening around us might be awful, but that over there, elsewhere, it was all right. We thought that we'd just been unlucky, that we were the exceptions. You have to understand, she said, people so wanted to believe. Now, Zarefshan's paranormal epidemic is a really good example of the importance stories can play in holding communities together. The visions had been going on for two years by the time I went there. And as I later learned, it had been a particularly traumatic period for the people of Zarafshan. For a start, they'd been very, very privileged in Soviet days. Theirs had been uh, a town where, you know, with extraordinarily good housing, shops full of good things, high salaries. And when the Soviet the Union started to wobble, all that disappeared. And they found instead that they were imprisoned. And they were imprisoned in, some, in what was, they now learned, also an ecological disaster. Because um, the cyanide, which is used in gold mining, had escaped into the atmosphere. 
and was causing havoc, quite apart from the pesticides which had been overused in the cotton industry nearby and um, had gone into the now dried up Aral Sea just to the north of them. On top of all this, uh, they who were the colonial masters suddenly found with independence that they were not at all popular. The rise of nationalism had left them um, you know, in a very tricky position. This town, which had one water pipe connecting it across the desert, was literally a hostage to that nationalism. So it was hardly surprising that they were in a state of panic. So these visions were a response to extremity. The extraordinary thing that I learned was that throughout this period, they'd gone on working this very rich complex, very productively and peacefully. And the reason why goes back to leadership. That mining end, that water engineer, Vasya, had been delegated to deal with this epidemic of the paranormal. And he had, um, I'm sure he believed it himself, but whether or not he did is scarcely the point. The, he had managed to convince them all that this wasn't the end of their world, that this was actually the beginning of a new cosmic religion, and um, that they were very privileged, therefore. And he could give a lot of, of intellectual and philosophical lineage to this, because there was a, a philosopher in the 19th century called Fyodorov who had um, believed that the cosmos was full of intelligent life. And his philosophy, strange though it sounds to us in the West, had become part of the common law of the Soviet uh, science, so, r r space program, um, who uh, really did believe that what they were going to do was to colonize um, outer space, an outer space that was already full of intelligent life, so the opportunities would be unlimited. And. Um, that's by way of really sort of illustrating um, how important operative myths are. And the period I want to talk about today, to go back to today, the 1992-93, is um, at that moment the Western press was busy saying, and still says today, that um, Yeltsin was bringing democracy to Russia, but it wasn't at all the experience of ordinary people. What was, um, they had just let go of one operative myth, and they were reaching out for ours, for, for the Western dream. But even before they, even as they reached for that Western dream, they were being hit by a sort of economic earthquake. And um, I'd just like to remind you of the, a few of the sort of devastating facts of that earthquake. Within a few weeks of the end of the Soviet Union, prices rose by 400%, just in a few weeks. Um, within two years, inflation had gone up to 2,000%. And um, people, there had only been 1.3% of the population had been living on the, popula on the, on the poverty line in the end of the Soviet Union. Within a couple of years, it was 40%. Now, it's the only example in history of a peacetime reversion of a developed country back to pre-industrial conditions. And it had cataclysmic consequences. Um, the average age of men was uh, a male expectancy, life expectancy was 68 at the end of the Soviet Union. Four years later, it was 58. And 40% um, of people were living on the poverty line. Frankly, uh, it was impossible to tell quite how people were keeping fed. You know, in an extended family, there would be somebody who could keep the family going, but it, it, it wasn't at all obvious how. Well, when I went to that town and no one would speak to me, and I was being treated like a spy, 
what got me through was a handful of very bright young Democrats who were passionate about the opportunity that was awaiting them. And I'd just like to tell you about a few of those because they're such sort of key people for the whole idea of, of, of democracy. Anna, uh, perhaps my closest um, friend in Russia, in another life, she would have been a very beautiful young woman in, in, in Russia. This, she was this tall, awkward woman who walked as if her clothes were full of prickles. And um, she was a very brave campaigning journalist. So brave that um, because she was arguing the case of the Russian Germans for their homeland, she'd lost her job and her flat, which was the only possession she would ever have. And um, she went on through the 1990s to be a to campaign absolutely to the risk of her life again and again against official corruption. And um, battling away to create a democratic space and to educate people about the horrors of the past uh, so that they wouldn't sentimentalize communism. And when Putin came to power, it was only then that she really started to sort of despair because that was when the press lost its last freedom. And her final hopes for democracy faded. And she, she was asking along with so many people right across Russia, who am I if I'm not Soviet? Um, what does it mean to be Russian today? And so many of these people had hoped that being democratic would be the answer, but instead she had to search for a different way of being Russian. And she turned towards spirituality for answers. And at, at first, she was attracted to the Catholic Church, which was, um, there was a wonderful little cell of, of um, a wonderful Irish uh, Father Michael in Saratov and had a multi-ethnic little group of nuns. and. She loved being with them, but very soon the doubt set in that this was not um, this was another way of sort of being Western, but it wasn't helping her with cracking the problem of how to be Russian. So she pulled away from that and started to try and become um, to join the Orthodox Church, which wasn't very easy because um, the Orthodox Church had been through a very tough time in, um, I mean, the, actually the hardest period of, of Christian persecution since the Roman Empire. And um, 800,000 churches had been either razed to the ground or used for other purposes. Uh, 900 churchmen had lost their lives. And those who had stayed in the church were um, demoralized, poorly educated, and many of them had, in order to continue at all, been co-opted by the KGB. So it wasn't much of a place for spiritual answers at the point of the transition from communism. But she battled away with it, and, um, and of course the church has now um, revived and has attracted wonderful um, caliber of, of clergymen now, but it's, it's a difficult church because you know, the, the language they use is a, is a basically sort of Byzantine medieval language and um, women have to wear headscarves and um, long clothes and it's tough for a modern girl to, you know, to, to get to grips with. But in, inside, she did find in orthodoxy a way of being Russian which was, um, which, which was clear of corruption and gave rich answers, but as she went on her spiritual journey, I found it harder and harder to communicate with her because it was very clear that her, she had started to see the West as having betrayed her, the, this, this great dream that she'd had. And I was a representative of the West. and. Um, there was more, our friendship was sort of hedged around with more and more 
awkward silences, judgments that she wasn't prepared to you know, deliver to my face, but um, we battle with them still. Her friend Misha, um, very different character, equally important for the building of communism, and um, was a, was a, he was just a chewing gum and soft drink salesman from when we met. He was operating from the back of his car, and he was a wonderful character, sort of marvelous sportsman, full of passion for the rebuilding of Russia, and very ambitious too. And um, his friends used to laugh at him, and they said, you're just much too soft and much too honest. You'll never make it in this world of Russian businessmen. You're just not a thug. And he used to say to me and to them, you wait, I'm going to be a power in this province. You may think that we started by lying and stealing from the government, but there wasn't any other way. We we're going to be fabulously rich, and only then will we get around to tackling the chaos you see all around you. Mark my words, the West will have to watch out. They're going to go mad with boredom. They've got a system. Where's the fun? Here, you build your own world every day. It's a game of skill, and there are no rules. You watch. We're going to turn Russia around. Now, Misha has, against the odds, although he didn't start by inheriting a piece of that wealth that was privatized um, by Yeltsin's team after the fall of communism, he had no capital. But by sheer dint, he has made himself into a very successful entrepreneur and industrialist. He sells wonderful quality of virgin sunflower oil. He runs large farms on the Volga. And all went swimmingly until Putin came to power. And even when the rest of the Russians were all saying, yeah, it's fine, got order, got stability, safe in the streets, it's fine. Misha was saying, mm -mm, you've got it wrong. This is not the kind of stability that Russia needs. Um, we need, um, this is going to lead to terrible corruption uh, because everything has been privatized again. I mean, the power has been privatized again. And it's true, uh, Misha is still hanging in there as a businessman. He's um, determined not to give up, but he's a very changed man. He's much older than his years to look at and he's taking to the bottle. And in order to stay in the game at all, he's had to come to deals with this corrupt bureaucracy because every day he wakes up and he doesn't know whether his business will have been simply you know, taken away from him. The locks changed um, and he would have no rights then because it would just mean that somebody has better official contacts than him. So he's a very disillusioned man, and, um, and he's somebody who's intrinsically pro-Western. He gets his technology from the West. His, he sees Russia's future as facing West. But you know, even he has um, become much more <coughs> cautious in his Westernism because he, um, it all came out when the Georgia war uh, broke out, Russia's war with Georgia, which he saw, of course, as a proxy war between the US and Russia. And he would speak to me bitterly about the injustice of the fact that NATO, having agreed not to expand eastward, uh, then proceeded to go on expanding eastward and eastward right up until to, you know, consider, considering including Ukraine. And that was a kind of broken promise which made him feel that the West was just not to be trusted. Now the third character I want to talk about is the most glamorous and um, the most reckless. She's the daughter of um, the old Soviet elite. Her father was a, one of the big construction bosses in Siberia. And she had known all the rottenness of communism 
from, she was a highly educated, brilliant woman, and she could see that the end was coming, and she wanted nothing of this corrupt regime. She turned her back on it and came to Marx because she, like me, thought this was a place that was going to get democracy um, and prosperity sooner than anyone else. And she and her husband started a little newspaper to teach people about you know, freedom and the future and um, a bit of forward thinking. But when the Russian homeland project collapsed, she too, like the people of Zarafshan, was trapped in that little town because she bought a, ta a, a house there and couldn't sell it. And people in the town were as suspicious of her as they were of me because she was an aristocrat in Soviet terms and you know, not, a, not a simple country person. And um, today she has got out and she lives in Crimea where she runs another underground newspaper battling away with official corruption. But it's taken a terrible, terrible toll on her. She's, she's become uh, um, an alcoholic and she's gone sort of crazy um, with, with grief, really. Um, and there's one thing that she said to me in one of my dark days when I was really gloomy about what was going on? She said, "Don't blame them. Don't, don't, don't get so upset. You in the West were our dream, and when it collapsed, we blamed you. But you weren't to blame. We just had no idea how to be free. When the Soviet Union fell, the country went into a sort of nervous breakdown, and we didn't realise that nothing could change until people found themselves." Natasha is right. Nothing's going to change in Russia until people have found themselves. But things are going to change. And they'll change in the right direction eventually. Because they've got to. There is now a widespread acceptance of the fact that the Putin model of sovereign democracy is leading nowhere. And the most blatant symptom of this is the disabling level of corruption. I mean, you can buy your way into the best college, you can buy your way through the exams. In one university I know, they simply siphon the students into two different rooms, and there's the room where the normal students sit their exams, and in the other room, they just fed the answers. That's the kind of corruption we're talking about. Now, the, only, the reason why I'm confident is that there's only one way of tackling this corruption, and the elite knows it, which is by reinventing a civil society. You, you, can't, you can't tackle it as poor old President Medvedev is trying to do by ticking people off and giving them exhortations to be less corrupt. You actually need a plural, pluralism. You need a free press. You need an independent judiciary. We need a, a political opposition. They all know that. It's just a question of how we get from there to here. And of course, events in the Arab world um, are a very potent factor in the, it's sent shivers of alarm through um, the whole elite. Um, but it cuts the other way too. Of course, the, the rise in oil prices means that um, they no longer need to um, worry quite so much about attracting Western investment, which they have, which really, they really do need to diversify and modernize their economy. But um, now there will be a bit more, I mean, a good deal more money, which they can put into um, diversifying, modernizing. But um, that only puts off the problem on a temporary basis because it's all clear to everyone in Russia how close the parallels are, for instance, between Egypt and Russia. The features are all the same, the authoritarianism, the massive gap between the rich and poor, the corruption, 
But there's one difference, which is that the Egyptians have got a fairly decent uh, independent judiciary, which the Russians don't have. And the reformers are now arguing very passionately day by day in the press that um, radical reform is the way of preventing Russia going the way of the Middle East. But at the same time, the hardliners are, have also got ammunition to um, clamp down on the internet and to um, beef up um, security in, in, in many different ways. So there's a, a fierce battle going on right now, and it's got much fiercer in the last few weeks and much more unpredictable. But one thing you can be sure, and this goes back to what I was saying in the first place, that change is not going to come from people coming out in the frozen streets. It's going to come from the elite, because people have been disenchanted with the idea of what um, a free society has to offer. They, they thought, and they, they were shafted by it, and they're going to need coaxing back into it. The elite, 40% of it at the moment, will admit in private that pluralism is what they need. Um, but they're now going to have to get there in their own way. It's, they're never going to want to adopt our model of Western democracy. They're, they're going to make a kind of democracy which will look different to us. And I think that the best thing we can do right now is not um, risk any um, counter-reactions by trying to nudge them too fast, because it could be counterproductive. The best thing we can do is make sure that we can be beacons of democracy and give democracy back some of the good name that they think it's lost. <laughs>